All right, so uh, looking at the Hagenbuch article that starts on 374, um, I like this article because Hagenbuch is keen on emphasizing that marketing at its core is an honorable profession. And although some certainly do go about it by means of deception, still at its core, I think that marketing is informative. And this is something that can be justified and defended. Okay, um, the model that he uses is marketing as reconciliation. And I'm gonna read a little bit from the text on pages, well, primarily on page 377 here, okay, but I'm going to also be looking at a couple of uh, pages following that. In a capitalist economy, it is essential that buyers and sellers be able to connect with each other, okay, or in other words, overcome the natural um, natural I guess, alienation that they have from each other by means of appropriate communication and by means also of appropriate care or concern. Okay, This is all an idealized relationship since obviously a lot of the time uh, there's a lot of manipulation that goes on. But ideally, buyers and sellers are engaging in a mutually profitable enterprise. And I'm reading here on page 377, I think Hagenbuch is right to designate this as reconciliation. He says, reconciliation, therefore, is fundamentally about restoring, building, and maintaining strong relationships. And as the model in figure one illustrates, a Christian vocation understood in the broadest sense as one that supports reconciliation between oneself and God, oneself and others, others and God, and others and others. Okay, um... On the next column, he writes, marketing seeks to encourage exchange that benefits buyers and sellers equally. Unlike a zero-sum game in which one party must lose in order for the other to win, both parties improve their situations through the exchange. Again, that's idealized, but it is uh, that which uh, I think we should be aspiring to as we go into, some of us at least, go into the field of marketing and as we think about the ethics of what we're doing. There are some misconceptions that Hagenbuch uh, canvases in the balance of the article. And I want to go through those misconceptions uh, one by one. Okay, Without a doubt, Hagenbuch is right that the impression that the majority of the society has of marketing tends to be negative when you look at the statistics. For instance, on page 378 in the second column near the top, Hagenbuch writes, um, given the inherent consistency between marketing and Christian vocation, why do so many people still believe that the discipline fosters estrangement, not reconciliation? The blame does not rest with the fundamental tenets of the discipline, but with the actions that some people and organizations take under the auspices of marketing. And without a doubt, as we've seen in some of our case studies in the course of this module, a lot of marketing involves psychological tricks uh, various tactics to try to uh, make people think that they need something that they don't in fact necessarily need. And in fact, this is the first misconception that he canvasses. Okay, And well, I wouldn't go so far as to call it a misconception, I think there's a lot of truth here as a characterization of the field, that uh, a lot of marketing does encourage selling things to people that they do not need. Still, I take it that his point here is that this is wrong to label, all, it is wrong to label all marketing as this. Okay, um, but at any rate, he says, uh, one of the most common indictments of marketing theory is that it supports selling products to people that they do not need. Um, there is a way to get into marketing and to sell products in a way that doesn't have to require the manipulation of the customer or the, um, the psychological tactics that a lot of marketers resort to. And what I mean here is, um, look, if you don't want to have to deceive customers or pseudo-deceive customers with psychological tactics, 
don't go into a field where you're marketing a product that you don't believe is good for the customer. If the product is good for the customer, and if you know the product is good for the customer and you sincerely believe it to be good for the customer, then you're not going to have to engage in psychological tricks and tactics in order to convince the customer to purchase the product. This is, uh, I think, a very commonsensical tip that uh, it would be good if people uh, more generally were willing to, um, that would be good for people more generally in order to, um, to follow. And this would actually resolve the second misconception on page 379 uh, as well. He writes, a second common criticism of marketing theory is that it advocates using deception to persuade people to buy products. This criticism is perhaps levied most often at advertising marketing's primary form of mass communication. Okay, and while, again, I wouldn't call this a misconception, I think that a whole lot of marketing uh, does rely upon at least uh, pseudo-deception, if not uh, outright attempts to uh, plant fraudulent thoughts in the minds of consumers. Uh, still, I take it that his point is that honest marketing doesn't have to be this way, and it would be wrong to label all marketing this way. Okay, um, on page 380, his third misconception is that marketing theory suggests that a given product should be sold to everyone. Okay, uh, he writes, a third and final misunderstanding of marketing theory is that it encourages sellers to try to persuade all consumers to adopt their product offerings. And as he goes on to expand on this misconception, it actually seems to be, as a misconception, a, um, or as, as, a, as a critique, it seems to be a criticism against the oversaturation of marketing in our society. Okay, and sh for sure, marketing is everywhere. Uh, advertisements are everywhere. And there is, I think, a, a kind of an oversaturation that has occurred, and this has led to us seeing all sorts of irrelevant ads all the time that take up brain space and that are very annoying. Um, but at the same time, I don't think that it is the responsibility of individual marketers to worry about whether the society is oversaturated with the amount of advertising. Okay, if the society is oversaturated, if it's harmed the beauty of the society, you know, the number of billboards undermines the, um, the landscape or the number of ads that we encounter in other areas of our lives undermine our ability to, to focus and to concentrate on meaningful tasks um, and more meaningful pursuits. Look, that's something that uh, we have regulators for and that can be limited. But I don't think it's the responsibility of individual marketers necessarily to, uh, to fail to market right, the products that they've been uh, designated to market precisely because they're worried about some larger issue like uh, oversaturation. Um, is it true that marketing has harmed the, uh, the aesthetics of the society that has harmed the ability of people to focus and concentrate on meaningful tasks? Yeah, probably. That's probably the case. Um, does it have to be your ads? Not necessarily. And is it the responsibility of you as an individual marketer? Again, not necessarily. Um, none of these ideas that I'm sharing here are necessarily the only way to interpret Christian moral principles in the field of marketing. Okay, uh, basically, there's not much guidance given to us here uh, in the Christian moral tradition on this particular topic. Uh, we are just told repeatedly that we're supposed to be honest in our business contracts, but we aren't told precisely what that honesty means. And so there's room for different interpretation here. And so when I say that um, it's not necessarily the job of individual marketers to worry about whether their particular ads are uh, undermining people's ability to focus on other things that are meaningful in life, uh, that's an interpretation of the general principle, uh, be honest in your contracts, uh, don't deceive others. But certainly there are other interpretations as well, and it doesn't have to be this particular interpretation. Okay, I'm gonna motor on to the second Hagen book article, which actually comes before this one, and starts on page 372, so that I can focus uh, in the balance of the lecture on a couple of other things. Okay, um, in the second Hagen book article, uh, Hagen book is actually responding to uh, Gene Kilborn, uh, who 
is a well-known consumer advocate and critic of precisely what we were just talking about, oversaturation of advertising, but also more generally she's an advocate and critic of the ways in which marketing, uh, as she would say it, uh, degrades society or um, undermines uh, certain constructive things in the society. Let me get into precisely what that means. On page 372, Hagenbuch writes near the top of the first column, Dr. Kilborn aptly identified uh, several important social concerns relative, related to the negative influence of certain types of advertising. For example, some advertising portrays uh, women in ways that treat them as objects. Okay, in addition, there is much more advertising than most of us would like for products such as cigarettes and alcohol. Also, ads for these specific products often do make blatantly false associations, such as healthy people smoke cigarettes. Okay, and the umbrella criticism here is that marketing is, um, is degrading to the social fabric or undermines people's moral sensibilities. Okay, um, let me uh, provide us with a particular example of that on page 373. Uh, again, there could be different examples that could be cited here. This is just one example. But I thought I would just throw this out there and see if anybody had an opinion about it. So I'm going to throw it open for questions or comments in just a minute. Um, this is near the bottom of the second column on 373. Finally, Dr. Kilborn purported that advertising is responsible for several social ills. Um, as previously discussed, one first should be careful to distinguish certain types of harmful ads from the rest of advertising. Uh, furthermore, in any research, one should be cautious about ascribing causality. Eating disorders represent a devastating social problem that we all would uh, like to see eradicated. Do ads that show inordinately skinny models actually cause eating disorders, however? My instincts tell me that certain ads definitely cannot be helping the situation. At the same time, though, one should not overlook other influential factors, such as Americans' taste for high-calorie foods, aversion to regular exercise, and obsession with physical appearance, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, and um, the criticism here is that marketing with some of its psychological tactics actually is harmful to the social fabric. And in this particular case, uh, this is a well-known criticism of advertising. Um, advertising shows us, advertising for apparel, for example, shows us models who are uh, unrealistic and not real people, uh, like the general um, the general society. And as such, this is harmful to people psychologically. Okay, so to take just one example, um, I, w I asked the dean uh, prior to the semester if I could uh, offer you guys a PowerPoint of uh, Victoria's Secret, the apparel company, and the dean said no, uh, for probably obvious reasons. Okay, but we're all familiar with Victoria's Secret, and so we could imagine what such a PowerPoint would look like. Okay, and Victoria's Secret is just one example of many in the apparel world, but it tends to be kind of an extreme example because of their particular uh, brand of advertising. Okay, and they're well known for uh, models who have a certain body type. And the criticism that they often come in for um, is that this is psychologically manipulative uh, to their customer base. Okay, because customers look at these ads and they think to themselves, wow, you know, uh, if I just had this clothing, then I'd look like that. Um, and other customers look at these ads and they think to themselves, I'm never going to measure up. I'm worthless. Uh, I, I'm, just, I'm just a worm. Okay, and maybe other customers look at these models uh, and these ads and think to themselves, uh, wow, wow. Um, I can maybe make myself look like this, and you get uh, psychological problems and you know eating disorders arise and things like that, right? And again, Victoria's Secret is just one example. This is widespread in the apparel industry, but it tends to be a kind of an extreme example, so they, they tend to run into more criticisms than most apparel companies on, on things like this. Um, so I guess I was gonna uh, use this case study, I mean, had I, done, had I done this particular case study for us, to uh, throw it open and ask you guys, um, are these ads that are run by Victoria's Secret or by any apparel company that runs similar sorts of ads, are these ads intended to 
create psychological vulnerabilities in the customers, vulnerabilities that can be then exploited by the apparel seller, by Victoria's Secret, to sell more of their apparel. Um, and if they are intended to create psychological vulnerabilities, is that a problem? Is that something that uh, is or ought to be out of bounds when it comes to the ads that apparel companies run? Uh, is this damaging to the social fabric, in other words, which is Kilbourne's criticism of, uh, of such ads? What do we think of that? Uh, what do we think of that kind of a criticism? Uh, is it the responsibility of apparel manufacturers and advertisers to worry about the psychological well-being of their customers? Uh, are the ads that are often shown uh, intended to create vulnerabilities so as to sell products, you know, so as to create weak customers, vulnerable customers who are more susceptible to product? And is that a problem? What do we think about that criticism? Yes. Oh, for sure it would, absolutely, without a doubt. And many people do return the clothing when they, they uh, try it on and don't like how they look. Um, I guess the criticism that Kilborn and others uh, are leveling is more that um, there's something morally worrisome about advertising that's designed to make customers feel inferior unless and until they have a product. And that's what the apparel companies are doing is the criticism, yeah. The customers feel, you know, as though they don't measure up, and so they try to, you know, they fall into patterns of action that, you know, try to make their bodies into what does measure up so that they can be part of the cool crowd, or that, um, or they become vulnerable to, uh, to sales tactics that pitch clothing to them that, you know, they wouldn't otherwise get, but they get just so as to look a certain way like that. And uh, the criticism is that that's actually not good for people to make them feel vulnerable and inferior. What do we think? Comments? Thoughts? Yes? I feel like all this needs to happen the Like, if, like, in years ago, the, the marketing strategy would have worked, but since now it's more like women have been more positive about about their body image. And oh, like sure. That. Yeah, the body positive movement. Yeah. yeah, so I feel like they need to switch their marketing because it's not going to work anymore. I feel mm -hmm. like people have more plus size and more like the curvy girls, skinny girls because um, Victoria's Secret just like targets to the one specific like range of sizes they have in mm -hmm. the store. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the body positive movement, um, there's actually a male body positive movement too, believe it or not. But it's something that, um, that has happened as a backlash to what was seen as uh, um, a what was seen as marketing that had gone too far. And, uh, and it's not just marketers either, okay? There are other, other you know, things, in society, influences in society, um, pop culture and the like, that uh, do pitch a particular look as being the only look that is worthwhile or that can make people feel attractive or good about themselves. So it's not just uh, marketers for sure. Uh, and yeah, maybe they do need to pivot now. Uh, they haven't been doing as well financially, actually. Victoria's Secret in particular has not been doing as well recently, so um, they maybe need to pivot because there's been a backlash against that. What do we think about ads that apparel companies run? Are they, uh, like, like what's being described here, are they intended to create vulnerabilities, and is that a problem? Like, is it okay if vulnerabilities are created in customers? One or two more comments. I don't know if like every intention is that way. Mm -hmm. Like okay. I feel like it may Good. vary between companies. Okay. Um, but also it's at the company's discretion if they want to take that risk mm -hmm. and then the customer also can choose if they want to buy from that company or not. Um, Good. But I also yeah. think the customer does have some responsibility um, to interpret their advertising the way mm -hmm. they want to. Sure. And two, uh, I mean, we've all been in the society long enough to know some of the, the tricks of the trade, and customers 
should be able to some extent to protect themselves from ads that are intended to be, you know, psychologically, uh, uh, manipulative might be a little bit strong as a word here, but at least psychologically influential in their lives. Okay, good. I think that's a good word. All right, it's food for thought, something to think about. It's a common criticism of a lot of marketing, namely that, um, and this is just one example of it, namely that the marketing is designed to put customers in a vulnerable state and that that's a problem, that marketing shouldn't be aimed at doing that. It should be uh, more informative rather than um, rather than attempting to be psychologically influential. Okay, um, that does it for these articles. Uh, I'm going to wrap up the marketing ethics module now. Are there any final comments or thoughts on any of the topics we've talked about in the marketing ethics module? The surveillance ethics, the topic of appropriate disclosure, how much you need to disclose about the products, um, positives and negatives, the topic of deception in advertising, or the topics that we just covered, uh, things like whether advertising uh, is responsible for for social damage or for, um, or for problematic psychological manipulation. Any questions about any of those topics? Okay, we're turning then to an accounting ethics module. Again, these are short little modules that we're doing um, in order to look at some field-specific issues that arise within the various subfields of business. Okay, and uh, I have to say as a starting point, as we go over this accounting ethics module material, I have to say as a starting point that um, in comparison to marketing, accounting ethics tends to have a much better reputation. Okay, not to say that marketing, like the, again, not to, to diss the marketers um, as a whole, because we don't have to be uh, the problem in the field that we go into. We can be the change that needs to be seen in the field that we go into. Okay, but accounting does tend to have a little bit better reputation in the eyes of the general public. Okay, that doesn't mean that accounting is not without certain problems. Okay, and we're going to actually focus on a, a couple of those problems in the balance of our lecture today. Okay, but I do want to emphasize at the outset that although we are just focusing kind of on the problem, uh, in fact, the core problem in accounting ethics today. Still, um, many, many accountants that I have known personally and that I have read about uh, are, have successfully resisted some influences and incentives to be unethical. And I would say the great majority of accountants uh, don't fall prey to the influences that we'll be discussing here. Okay, but let's go ahead and talk about um, what might be called the core problem in uh, modern corporate accounting. Okay, and if you'll turn to the, uh, the Staubus and Stewart articles. Let's start with the Stewart article, actually. I will describe precisely what that problem is. Okay, so let's just call it, as a talking point, the problem in corporate accounting. And I'll just use it as an example of public company to describe the problem. But this could also be an issue for private companies as well. Any company that needs financing is going to face this particular topic. Okay, so let's just imagine a company that's seeking um, public auditing uh, services for the sake of raising capital. That's a very common issue in public business. Okay, so there are internal audits, external audits, um, both have their uses. Maybe for the purposes of this, um, example, we'll assume that it's a public company seeking external auditors. And the primary reason why they seek these auditors, in addition to you know compliance with regulatory expectations, is in order to obtain financing from financiers. Companies need financing in order to expand their operations. They need financing in order to engage in research and development, various forms of, uh, of product uh, testing require financing. 
Okay, so a very common uh, relationship between management and accountants then is that management employs uh, the accountants in order to provide the financiers with a certain picture of the company. And by that I mean that uh, management uses the services of the accountants in order to guarantee for the financiers a, a clean bill of health guarantee that the company's finances are as it is representing them to be, okay? And that's a, a really common kind of a reason for employing accountants. It's the uh, main reason, perhaps, that uh, certainly public companies employ accountants because they've gone to the public markets in order to seek financing, but also private companies need financing as well. Financiers can take different forms, by the way. They can include equity providers, so if you hold shares, in a company, you can be provi a provider of equity for that company. Um, but they could also include credit providers. So if, if, um, if management is seeking to uh, take out uh, you know, a round of, um, of credit financing from some banking operation, the financiers then are not necessarily just retail uh, shareholders. They could also be investment banks or other kinds of financing um, providers. At any rate, though, the job of the auditors is to ensure those financiers that their uh, investment can be, uh, that they can know with confidence that their investment is in uh, a company whose finances are as it's representing them to be. These two arrows up here are both um, arrows of information. Okay, management provides the auditors with uh, the books that the auditors then inspect, and the auditors then provide the financiers with public statements about the nature of what they encounter, about the, um, the nature of the financing that they are uh, witnessing. Uh, I'm sorry, the nature of the, uh, of the balance sheet that they're seeing, or the cash flow statement that they're seeing. Okay, but that's not all that is at play in this relationship here. Here's the problem. Here's where the difficulty comes in. Because they're actually, there's actually money exchanging hands here as well in this relationship. Okay, one arrow of monetary exchange uh, ties financiers to management. Because management, after all, is uh, employing the accountants in order to obtain financing. The financiers provide management with uh, capital in the form of credit or in the form of equity raises, various other forms of Capital can be provided as well. Sometimes companies fund their operations in fully internally, but that's rare. Most uh, re rely upon some form of financing in order to expand their operations. Okay, so one of the arrows of, mon of money flow in this relationship is between financiers and management, so that management can obtain the, um, or can reach the goals that they're seeking uh, in the course of their um, of, uh, efforts to obtain financing. Okay, but that's not the only monetary arrow. There's also, in addition to this information arrow, we'll say I for information and I for information here, there's also another money arrow here. Okay, and that's the problem. This is the key problem right there. Because management has to pay the auditors in order to obtain the clean bill of health that they're seeking for their balance sheets as they go to the public for financing. Management has to pay the auditors. Um, the auditors then function as employees, even if only temporarily, if they're external auditors as contract employees. They function, though, as employees of management. And that's the problem, is that the money is only flowing one way. Okay, the money flows from management to the accountants. And the problem is that this influences uh, the accountants in many uh, instances, many cases. Okay, it, at the very least, it colors the perceptions that accountants have of the company's finances as the accountants inspect the company's balance sheet and look at its various um, different corporate statements. At that most, it actually leads uh, some accounting firms, again in extreme cases, to uh, participate with management in outright fraud, uh, like in the Enron case. Okay, in the Enron case, uh, the core problem in the accounting firm, Arthur Anderson, that was 
uh, that provided the public with this you know, guarantee that Enron's finances were indeed what they claimed them to be. The core problem was that Arthur Anderson, the auditing company, was seeking to obtain greater, um, co uh, more contracts from Enron, the, um, the company that was employing them. They wanted consulting services. They wanted uh, a larger play in the auditing process. They were influenced in a variety of ways by the one-way flow of money. Okay, so that's an extreme example, but at the very least, the flow of money in this uh, direction and in this direction only does often uh, color the perceptions that auditors have of the company's finances. Okay, um, notice that there is no monetary arrow tying these two players, the auditors and the financiers. Rather, it's just an information error, not a monetary error as well. Okay, that means that the auditors in this particular example, and you know, in any similarly uh, structured example, the auditors are not beholden to the financiers and are not, uh, in many cases, motivated uh, by a desire to provide the financiers with a wholly honest look at the company's uh, financials. Okay, um, let me give you guys an analogy here, just as a way of making this relationship a little bit more intelligible. Okay, uh, at HBU, we participate in the Southland Conference in most of our athletics, right? Uh, some of us are athletes, yes? Okay, what sport? Uh, football. Football? No. Golf? Football. That's right. Okay. Um, so I'm going to use uh, Spencer's football example, right? Okay, so um, we employ refs when we play Southland Conference games. Uh, did we play any conference games this fall? Uh, this fall? Yeah. Yeah, it's going to be like a short of a biological something. No, no, I mean this last fall. This last fall. Oh, no. I, don't, I didn't think we did, no. We but only played four games of like... Oh, yeah, I know. I know, yeah. Um, but it, it's still going to be shorter this next fall, too. Bit. Okay. okay, all right, interesting. Okay, good. Um, when HBU's football squad plays games, right, we um, employ refs, but these refs are actually almost always, at least for conference games, Southland Conference refs. Okay, and um, for non-conference games, maybe sometimes as well. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, who pays the refs? in the games that HBU plays? The league office, right? League office pays the refs. The refs do not work for HBU. Now, HBU pays dues to the league office as participants in the Southland Conference, and the league office then subsequently pays the refs, but there's like a middleman there, the league office, that serves as a kind of institution of impartiality. So the refs aren't actually directly working for any particular team. The game might be called differently, wouldn't have to be called differently, some, some refs would be honest, but it might be called differently if HBU employed the refs directly. Okay, and that's the problem at the heart of modern accounting is the teams employ the refs. Okay, the teams employ the refs. Um, and this influences the refs. The job of accountants is to serve ideally as independent scorekeepers or independent referees in the world of business so as to better improve the flow of money, the financing, the operations of the enterprise. Now, there have been some different proposals for how to uh, get around this core problem because it's a structural problem at bottom. The teams employing the refs is a structural problem, and although some refs are going to be honest and won't let the fact that the teams employ them influence them, still others won't be, and this will be a problem in that it will, you know, create all sorts of deceptions that the financiers then have to navigate, etc. Okay, but there have been some proposals. One proposal is to have the regulators pay the refs. Okay, so... Um, I'll just put a little question mark here because that's not the way it currently is structured. And by that I mean we can have the government step in and uh, pay. Okay, but uh, that comes with all sorts of other problems. That would be analogous to the Southland Conference paying the refs. 
but it does come with all sorts of other problems. Government can be corrupt too for one for one problem, right? Uh, government can uh, also because of you know potential corruption, it could also influence the auditors to see things its way. Generally speaking, wherever the money is flowing, that's the way business influence is flowing in the world of business. Okay. Um, also, additionally, government tends to be very inefficient. Okay, and it can lead to all sorts of wastefulness. A government tends to be a lot less efficient than private enterprise. We've found that out over the last couple centuries of capitalism. Okay, so that's not not now the primary relationship. Um, so uh, financiers could pay the reps, right? Since the financiers have a stake in this, they want honest accounting. Uh, Maybe that might take the form for public companies of some sort of a, a transaction tax. Every time you buy or sell shares, a certain very small percentage of the transaction would actually go to pay auditors for their job so that the auditors then would not just be influenced by one party in this relationship, but might be influenced by financiers as well. And uh, in that regard, at least they, they could be, you know, have more incentive to be honest to all parties. But that hasn't taken off. That idea of a transaction tax hasn't really taken off, mostly because people tend to think that, well, for a couple of reasons. One is that these days in the public stock markets, um, to take the public company example, uh, a lot of people have stopped conceiving of uh, shareholding as being owning a stake in the company, and they just see it as owning um, a particular Price, I think, that they see on their computer screens, and it's not really the old school, you know, Buffett style idea of actually owning a part of the company. And so the idea of paying a transaction tax to support the auditors who are, again, part of an enterprise that's actually the company and not just this stock that sometimes seems to flow freely of the company in the minds of the people who are financing it. Um, that's something that hasn't really taken off for that reason. Uh, there's also the whole issue of people not wanting to have to pay to jump in and out of, of company stock, and then the frequent trading and uh, the high frequency trading and all that. So that hasn't taken off because the different parties um, in the public markets often don't see it as being very much in their interests to pay a transaction fee like that. Okay, so the for better or for worse, the current structural arrangement is that this is not the case. And this is not the case, and management pays the auditors, and that's the core problem. Again, though, let me emphasize that doesn't mean that all accountants are influenced in uh, negative ways. Sometimes management actually lets, uh, plays a pretty, pretty hands-off role and says, look, we're going to pay you, but we want uh, truly honest accounting. We want you to tell us uh, and the world, you know, all the financiers that we're looking at, tell us truly um, what you think. Call it like you see it. Okay, so it, it doesn't necessarily mean that all management is corrupt or that all auditors are corrupt. It's just that there are some who are influenced by this. All right, I wanted to show us a case study today, uh, the Enron case, actually. I'm going to get it started. The Enron case is a much bigger case than a single day, though, and we'll be covering it over a couple of different days. Uh, but I want to see if there are any questions about this model first, which I'm calling the problem in corporate accounting. Are there any questions or comments about it? Everybody's a little quiet today. All right. I hope you guys are getting enough sleep at this point in the semester. <laughs> no. <laughs> if your sleep uh, is looking like, uh, you know, three hours, four hours, two hours, five hours, 14 hours, Saturday, right? Uh, this is probably a problem. <laughs> you should uh, you should investigate that. I, I I I speak from experience as a college student who I had no control over um, over my sleep situation when I was in college, and I that was the way like what I just described was the way I, I basically ran my week. Okay, let us take a look at a case study. Um, I'm gonna try to make this pretty quick. Again, the Enron case is gonna take us multiple days to get through. It's kind of I mean, it's the biggest 
corporate scandal in American history. It happened out of, actually in our fair city, in the city of Houston. It's nice to know that we're first at you know something that makes us famous. Um, Enron was founded by Kenneth Lay after merging Houston Natural Gas at Inter North. Several years later, oh, sorry for the typo. Jeffrey Skilling was hired as president and COO. The slide is way off, isn't it? I guess I'd say Chris didn't get up there and hit at it, but I'm afraid that'll do more damage than it would do good. Okay, throughout the late 1990s, Enron was considered one of the country's most innovative companies. Okay, um, Enron was one of the largest integrated natural gas and electricity companies in the world. Uh, it marketed natural gas liquids worldwide and operated one of the largest natural gas transmission systems in the world, totaling more than 36,000 miles. Okay, um, in the world of oil and gas, there are, at bottom, there are three different kinds of companies. There are upstream companies, there are midstream companies, and there are downstream companies. The upstream companies are the drillers. The companies that are out there are drilling for oil and natural gas in the Permian or out in the Gulf of Mexico or in other locations drilling. The midstream companies are the pipeline companies. They uh, run uh, pipelines which basically function as toll booths, uh, which transport the materials, the raw materials, to the downstream companies. The downstream companies are the refiners. Uh, the refiners uh, do just that. They refine the product, the raw product, into some finished um, good, like gasoline or, or plastics or all the other things that Houston's enormous refineries do and, and churn out. Okay, we have um, some of the world's largest refineries, I believe the world's largest refineries here in Houston. And uh, so this is certainly like ground zero for this kind of a business operation. Okay, um, Enron was primarily a midstream company. They were primarily a pipeline company. Although they had their finger in a couple of other pies, uh, they, at the end of the day, were a toll booth operator. Uh, and toll booth operators have steady streams of income, but they don't tend to be real sexy companies. They tend to be, uh, you know, just kind of steady, like run-of-the-mill, regular sorts of companies. Okay, uh, Enron, I guess I could say, um, was a, a midstream company that aspired to be something more. Okay, they aspired to be something more. They wanted to grow rapidly. And in that regard, actually, by the end of things, in the late 1990s, Enron also had become one of the largest independent developers and producers of electricity in the world, serving both industrial and emerging markets. Okay, so, uh, they uh, got into the electricity market so as to try to become sexier than just their midstream operations. Uh, they wanted to boost the stock price so the execs could cash in on enormous stock options, and they realized that the market wasn't that interested in their midstream operations. Incidentally, are, is anyone from California here? One California? OC? Is that right? If I remember right? Okay. Um, Enron actually was a major electricity provider to SoCal, and uh, back, when, back in the day, um, you know, you think California's electricity problems are recent. They're actually very old and have been going on for a long time. And uh, Enron regularly squeezed uh, California. And when Enron, um, when their documents after their bankruptcy came public, because bankruptcy documents have to be publicized, we got to see the internal emails of company execs about all the, the shenanigans they were pulling. And it uh, turns out it was entirely intentional for them to squeeze uh, Californians. They weren't like joking in their emails about you know, making Grandma Millie uh, pay up and stuff like that is kind of, uh, it's kind of distasteful. Okay, um, I'm going to do a couple more slides, but I'm not going to get through this whole presentation today, so uh, rest assured I will let you go at time. After a surge of growth in the early 1990s, the company ran into difficulties. The magnitude of Enron's losses was hidden from stockholders. The company folded after a failed merger deal with Dynegy Incorporated. In 2001, Enron's $63 billion in assets made it, at the time, the largest corporate bankruptcy in the United States history. Okay, um, here's the core problem. Um, I'm going to tell you guys in the course of our module, our accounting ethics module, precisely how they did it. So you get to know how Enron cheated. I'll tell you the nuts and bolts. But the core problem, the core issue was, this was a, 
a midstream company that aspired to be something more and they wanted to grow quickly into other markets and to do that they needed leverage so they needed to borrow money and they wanted to borrow money at good rates and in order to borrow money at good rates they uh, made their financials appear to be something that they were not and they levered up to an enormous extent borrowing lots and lots and lots of money uh, far beyond what a company like that should have been doing. Okay, and they did this in order to use that borrowed money to finance expansions of their operations. But they faked a lot of the assets that they used in order to secure the loans that they received. They were looking for better loan deals. And to obtain those better loan deals, they faked a lot of their assets uh, to fool banks and other credit providers into providing them with better interest rates. And uh, this created uh, a toxic situation. Major players include Ken Lay, Jeff Skilling, David Duncan, Sharon Watkins. Okay, um, These two guys uh, are the key Enron criminals. David Duncan, a uh, key Anderson participant, the accounting firm that um, was their audit partner. Sharon Watkins was the whistleblower. She emerged as the hero in all of this. Uh, she often gives talks, actually, um, here in Houston. Uh, Mike Creighton was telling me he might be able to get her here for our class. Um, that would be great, I think, if he could. I think she's got a pretty high speaking fee, so I'm not sure if we'll be able to obtain that. Um, I don't know. I'm still in talks with Mike. I'm not sure if it'll happen uh, this semester, so we've got lots of things uh, already going on this semester. Okay. Uh, on December 2nd, 2001, Enron declared bankruptcy. Thousands of people were thrown out of work, and thousands of investors, including most of the company's employees, lost billions of dollars as Enron's stock, uh, shares shrank to penny stock levels. Okay, it went from like $70 a share to like 23 cents a share in about 30 minutes of trading after hours. So that's a good reason not to put all your eggs in one basket. You never know when that basket might collapse. Okay, um, throughout January 2002, revelations poured forth from Enron, tales of shredded documents, stories of Enron execs seeking help from top government officials, allegations that company officials willfully ignored internal warnings about the accounting irregularities, even as they pocketed millions of dollars in stock market gains. Okay, very famously, Ken Lay, this dude right here, uh, gave a press conference where he uh, assured the public that uh, they could trust Enron's financials and that Enron as a company had never been sounder. And that very day, actually, he dumped his entire stock portfolio, at least of Enron stock, out into the public markets um, secretly, uh, and that later came out. Okay, and Enron was very chummy with lots of high government officials. They were in with the Bushes, although the Bushes are not implicated in this. But uh, they were very chummy with lots of government officials and had uh, connections at the highest level. Okay, um... Let me do one more slide and then I'll let you go. Critics say that government deregulation of the energy business is what created the environment for Enron to fall. Chairman and CEO Kenneth Lay had long taken part in Vice President Dick Cheney's task force on energy policy, which met behind closed doors. Enron execs, particularly Lay, were chummy with many in the U.S. presidential administration, including President Bush himself, who referred to his uh, friend Lay as Kenny Boy. Okay, um, so that almost certainly played a part and uh, led to regulators looking the other way uh, when warning signals were appearing. Okay, uh, we'll do the rest of this uh, presentation next time. Thank you for your attention. Sorry I kept you a minute over. Um, please stay tuned. I'm